TV. Well, welcome everyone to uh, the Brian Crombie Show on Canada One TV. I've got an interesting person for you to meet tonight. It's Dr. Kate Barrett. Uh, Kate is a medical doctor, specializes in oncology. She's from, uh, um, I, actually I'm not sure, I think we'll have to figure out that story. I think from uh, Western Canada, but also from Toronto um, and, uh, and uh, spent some time across uh, Canada, across the world in fact. And now we find her in Los Angeles where she's launched a company um, that specializes in counseling cancer patients. Anyway, what we thought we'd do is we'd bring her on uh, the show tonight to talk about uh, COVID-19, about lung cancer, about cigarette smoking, um, to really have sort of a canvas of uh, some major, some fairly major health issues. Uh, Kate, Dr. Kate, how are you? Welcome to our show. I'm great, Brian. Thanks again for having me on the show. It was a pleasure to be there last time, and I'm, I'm grateful that uh, here we are again to, to talk about some pretty um, significant global concerns in terms of, of uh, respiratory state. No question. So let's start with COVID-19. Um, yeah. You know, parts of uh, the world are, uh, are um, going down uh, the incline of the, the curve that people have talked about. Other parts are flattening, other parts are accelerating. And in the United States, it's interesting. It seems like, uh, you know, the, the first uh, centers of the, the infection, New York, New Jersey, et cetera, actually have got yeah. it under control and are declining fairly dramatically. Europe is declining. China is declining, if not almost flatlined but the Southern US and then uh, Brazil and Russia and, uh, and Africa are on the dramatic rise. So mm -hmm. is this COVID-19 over or not over yet? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it's over yet, Brian. And um, you know, you've hinted on kind of the dynamics of, of trends and things that are happening in different countries. It does seem like things are kind of happening in different trajectories um, throughout different countries have been affected at different times and, and different rates. I think right now, you know, with the incidence of, of uh, over 9 million and the deaths now reaching, the death toll now reaching almost a ha um, 470,000, it, it is becoming, you know, a, a very significant is issue. I think that yesterday, the WH, in terms of growth and further growth, um, yesterday, I think the WHO announced that over, um, it was the highest com a complete count of cases in a 24 hour period that we've ever seen before. I think they told uh, about 183, 100,000 cases with Brazil re leading the way, uh, about 55, uh, thousand came from Brazil alone, uh, the U.S. with 37K and, and India about 15,000. So, you know, what we're seeing is, 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 I think we're still in it, is the short answer. We're still in it for sure. The U.S., of course, has the highest number of cases of any country with about 2.3 2 million um, but, uh, but these other countries are, are, are not far behind, especially, as you said, Brazil, Russia, India, Chile, um, you know, we're seeing those rates show some serious sharp increases. And I think, how, how do, I think we're still in it. How do we reconcile this? You've uh, worked in medicine in both Canada and the United States and frankly around the world. Um, the United States has got, you know, most people would think the best medical system, the best healthcare system in the world, particularly if you're rich. Um, and yet they seem to have uh, not been able to control this at all. They seem to have got one of the worst public health reactions to it. Um, and you take a look at the graphs in Europe versus the United States, you know, the trajectory at one point in time was exactly the same. And then the U.S., uh, the European Union went down and the U.S. just continued to rise. Um, mm -hmm. What's going wrong in the United States? You know, I think, okay, so there's a, there, first of all, when, when you look across the globe, when we speak about trying to compare the U.S. to other countries, it seems like the, almost every country, they, I think they list 188 countries in total across the globe that are affected and out of, out of almost 200 countries in total. Um, so almost every country uh, that we've been able to identify and show has been affected um, by, by COVID-19. I think, I think one of the things that, that, um, that does account for the difference in, dif in, in these numbers, of course, is the testing and the amounts of testing that are done in different areas. Um, and the types of testing and then how they're reporting these things as well. So I think that that's why you see, um, that's why despite geographical, despite population density, uh, despite healthcare systems, you do see differences in numbers. So I think it's really multifactorial um, in, in when you're looking at those pure numbers. Again, um, 
it's difficult to draw strong comparisons when the denominator, like testing rates, like reporting rates, um, like uh, ability to identify cases even with or without testing is changing, when that denominator is changing all the time. Yeah. But, um, but you so, know, the, the data is, is getting sharper, it's getting better, um, and the reporting is getting better. And we have new things, like new efforts in terms of co uh, collecting data and understanding therapy. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the solidarity trials that the WHO um, has, has uh, been implementing. There's now three solidarity trials, one, two, and three. So solidarity one, it's it's an effort. It's basically a collaborative effort started by WHO to help support um, and expedite uh, studies and real world data in real in, in in a variety of real world settings, such that we can use that data faster um, and at a speed and rate and breadth and depth um, that would be more quickly than individual countries trying to you know on their own isolated concentrated effort. So. Solidarity trial started in mid-March. Um, it was a, it's an international phase three clinical trial. It compares four treatment options against the standard of care that analyzes what does slow the disease progression with COVID-19, what does improve survival. Um, it's, I think there's over 400 hospitals. It's active in about 30, more than 35 countries um, as part, part of this collaborative effort. Um, I think there's been 100 countries that want to participate at some level, but things have been been slow on on you know on uh, on getting things in, enrolled and going. But there's a lot of support there to even get you know some of the lesser countries um, in terms of socioeconomic status um, enrolled and supported through the, the these four main medications that they're trialing to see those reported outcomes. And do you so, know what the four medications are? Yeah, there's um, uh, one of them is the uh, remdesivir that was used in Ebola, um, and uh, it's, an R it's a type of um, medication called RNA polymerase 1. It's basically, um, it's an inhibitor of, of the virus replicative machinery process. Um, another drug... The preliminary uh, results, I understand, are that it's re reduced by some percentage uh, the yeah. uh, days in hospital. That, yeah, that's one of the parameters, um, absolutely. There was a little controversy. They were going to think about pulling it because of some differences in outcomes, but they've kept it in the, in the race and we've yet to kind of fully analyze the results. Also uh, chloroquine and hydrochloroquine and an HIV combination, um, some well-known HIV antiretrovirals are used as well as uh, the antiretrovirals in combination with interferon. So those are the backbone of the main uh, drugs that are being trialed. There's the solidarity. And uh, the chloroquine and the hydrochloroquine, I understand, are, have have not had any positive impact and have had major side effects. Is that the case? That's right. Uh, sorry, that's what I was speaking to a moment ago. It's the hydrochloroquine that they've they've recently tried to pull because they thought it had some conflicting evidence, but they've br brought it back into the game. Redes yeah, there. Yeah. No, I also so another solidarity too. Yeah, so Solidarity 2 is, again, a global collaboration of the WHO with public health and academic institutions to implement the serology test. So this is looking at antibodies. So this is going, this type of, so, so, so this will help us answer, answer a lot of questions um, by studying the serology assays, which is, which is done by a blood draw, and it will tell you if you have generated um, immunity to uh, COVID-19. So as you can imagine, um, with the variety of, of, of people that get different types of symptoms and different severity levels, um, it, it will allow us to have that information that, you know, that there are people that, that were maybe mildly or asymptomatic, did they actually have the virus and do they have immunity to it? Um, it will answer questions about exposure in different populations, who's been exposed and who hasn't. Um, and therefore who might be good candidates for the vaccine. Um, it will identify those who, not only those who have developed immunity, but those who have maybe been affected and haven't been, haven't been identified through traditional testing methods as well. So I think that this can answer, answer a lot of important questions um, if we're able to get that, uh, you know, the, the antibody detection and, and identify if there's um, immunity to the virus and immunity itself is a very complex thing, but, um, but uh, the body goes through that natural process uh, of, of developing immunity and those titers in the, in the bloodstream should be available for testing about four to, four to six weeks after um, you've recovered from the infection.
No, my understanding is that in China, they uh, actually staffed some of the hospitals that were dealing with COVID-19 patients with healthcare workers that had recovered because they assumed that they were immune. So is immunity not a foregone conclusion? You're saying we have to, we're not sure whether you're going to get immune if, if you've actually suffered and, and, uh, and gotten better? You technically should be immune. Um, and if you, have a, if you have a very good test, you should always be able to identify those levels of, of antibodies, um, the an known antibodies, I, which, are, which are known as immunoglobulins or IgG. But uh, typically, if you've gone through the infection, you should have been able to um, generate immunity, uh, or at least um, the IgG antibodies to the virus. Now, we've heard a lot about uh, testing, testing, testing uh, for the virus. Um, what about testing for the antibodies? Where's the status of that? So that's, that's part of the Solidarity 2 trial. Um, the test, currently, um, there's, it's, it's been approved by Health Canada. In terms of can, the, the status of the, the antibody test in Canada, it's been approved by Health Canada, mostly through two labs, I think, um, uh, two of the bigger labs, uh, biopharmaceutical companies, have produced um, t uh, tests that have been pretty well validated across the globe so far in trials. So they're the two that I think have been approved by Health Canada. They have yet to receive a licensure in individual labs for the release of the results. So we're just waiting on that information. Currently, we are using the serology testing in hospitals in select and certain cases. Um, but for widespread use uh, to write a, pers uh, a, re a requisition for a serology test and, and go and take it to the lab right now in Canada, we're still waiting for those independent labs such as Dynacare and Life Labs to get the licensure. Just to help me for a second, what is serology? So serology is basically the proteins measure, uh, immunoglobulins are one aspect of, of what would be in the uh, serum to be able to measure. So what happens, let's, let's just kind of unpack this a little bit so it makes sense. There's, if you, okay, so for anyone who, who is exposed to the coronavirus, as we know, there's usually about a five-day asymptomatic or window period. So during that time, your immune system will start to recognize that there is something unusual in the body. Of course, if you have lowered immunity, it will take longer to recognize and you don't quite have the defenses to overcome the rate at which the virus is infecting and replicating and, and causing side effects as a healthier person. Therefore, that's, that's why people with immunocompromise or lowered levels of immunity have a lot, of, a lot more difficulty identifying and fighting that disease as, 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 a normal, as, a, as a person with normal immunity would. So in that, but normally it takes about five, uh, up to five days for, for, for one to start to develop symptoms from um, the coronavirus specifically. So then after that, it takes about a week for your body to start going down an immune pathway called the antibody mediated pathway. Before that, it's just more of the cell mediated pathway that is like a general immune reaction that you would have. It's very not specific. But after that seven days, when you're going around going down the antibody mediated, it becomes very specific where the body is trying to take pieces of what it's seeing that's abnormal and trying to understand it and trying to create something that will combat only that specific infected cell such that it becomes very precise and a very targeted attack on the virus. And so, and, and through that process too, you start to see these um, immunoglobulins released that are called um, IgM, M stands for memory. And so at about, after about seven days, you start to get these initial immunoglobulins released. released and then of course- Into the bloodstream? Into the bloodstream, right? So it's 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 effect, it's trying to identify those cells out there that that are having that have the virus and are infected by the virus and trying to to destroy them. And so the meanwhile, the symptoms are ongoing, ongoing, and and uh, from what we've seen in coronavirus, on average, uh, the peak of symptoms happen after about two or three weeks, and then you begin to recover in about the fourth or fifth week. But after about two weeks, your your um, two or three weeks, your immune system will start to be intelligent enough 
that it has re determined what are some of these virulent, what we call antigens, what pieces of virus are easy flags to be able to develop specific immunity to or more specific ant immunoglobulins such that if, if this virus ever comes back to the body again, that it has that full capacity to, to recognize it through those IgG antibodies and to be able to then tell all of the other cells in the immune system that this is this specific thing is 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 detrimental to the body and mm -hmm. definitely to the body and we need to fight against it before it gets out of control and that's why usually the second time you're a lot better able to to um, to fight an infection than the first time or you become immune. Um, and this is also the concept behind vaccines and vaccine right. development. Okay, so in the vaccine development, uh, as you know, I've had the op opportunity to interview several people that are developing vaccines. And what they say the problem with, uh, with this virus is it creates a particularly uh, strong cyto cytokine storm. Can you tell me cytokine. what that is? So, so when does the cytokine storm develop is that your question or what yes and what is a cytokine storm so cytokine storm is pro is uh, so this this is kind of going down the pathway of of more of that initial process when your cells and your uh, cells and your immune cells are recognizing that that something abnormal has invaded and it needs to um it needs kind of more of a broad widespread um inflammatory response to try and quickly extinguish whatever is 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 causing it to to amplify and be be um, recognized so so basically in that initial process you'll get all of these cytokines released and this is the thing that's that generates specific symptoms uh, such as fever in fact um, and and the cytokines are there they're important they're uh, stimulating multiple pathways in the immune system but um, it will help you, uh, in a more of a broader or general and less directed approach as the antibody approach, but it's one way, one defense mechanism where you can generate symptoms to, um, to try to combat the disease or, you know, recruit other cellular, cellular um, processes such as fever, for example, raising your body temperature such that it kills off a bacteria or a virus in the body right. and, and other things. But the cytokine storm is that there's like way too much that the body for some reason is, is creating way That's right. Right. So, so, so like, um, so like some autoimmune disease, just the same as some autoimmune diseases, you can have an abnormally large or inappropriate amplified response where it becomes non-helpful in the sense that the symptoms that you're developing from the cytokine storm itself are harmful to the body and right. and demanding of recovery and the body's resources. So while you do get, are trying to ramp up and defend yourself, the defense is too strong and you're affecting too many cells um, in the body system and 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 it's actually you're you're ha you're not able to cope with the symptoms of the inflammation. And so therefore, there was a report last week that a mild steroid helps mitigate the cytokine storm. Does that make sense? Yeah, so so steroids dampen um, and and put it kind of a toner on the immune system, and so by uh, so what they've seen is is in this virus sometimes it'll elicit uh, this uh, you know severe acute respiratory syndrome as we all know is stands for SARS. So when you get that that inflammation within the lungs by giving a small a, a dose of steroids to decrease the inflammatory effect that the immune response can have in the meanwhile and cause a further amplification of respiratory symptoms, which can go out of control. By dampening that effect, you maintain the control at a certain level in a controllable level. It's just identifying which patients do need the steroids, which patients are tolerant of steroids, and, and, and what is the, the, the appropriate um, time to give. We're talking tonight with Dr. Kate Barrett. She is a medical doctor and oncologist, runs a company called Blue Guide that counsels uh, patients and uh, families on cancer. And we're talking COVID-19, cigarettes, lung cancer, et cetera. We're gonna take a break. Stay with us. Hi. Well, welcome back to the Brian Crombie show on Canada One TV. We're chatting tonight with Dr. Kate Barrett. She is a medical doctor and oncologist. She comes to us uh, tonight from uh, Los Angeles, uh, California. Kate, what are you doing in Los Angeles? I thought you were Canadian. 
Well, I am Canadian. Um, I uh, came down here originally in the new, pretty soon after the new year, um, to open a branch of my company here and to kind of work on the processes leading up to that. And then the pandemic happened, and I, I um, essentially have remained here since then. I'm waiting for the next direct flight out of out of LAX to come back to Toronto, but I can't complain. It's been it's been um, you know I think the pandemic's not been easy for anybody, but um, I certainly um, have have been all right. Well, that's we're glad you're all right. So, what's your story? <laughs> you you were educated in Canada. Whereabouts? Yeah. Yeah, so well, I grew up I grew up in a small town in Ontario. I grew up in Prince Edward County. And then um I sorry? Wine country. Now it is, but it wasn't when I was there. Um only in the last, I guess, 20 years or so. And now there's over 50 or 60 wineries, I think, now. But yeah, I um it was I don't think there was a single winery um by the time I left when I was 17. But I left when I was 17 and I went uh, to the West Coast, I went out to Vancouver and I did my undergraduate degree in biochemistry and I went straight to medical school at University of British Columbia. Okay, let me, let me interrupt for a second. So you went to, is it Trinity Western? Yeah, yeah, I went to Trinity for my undergrad. And um, I thought it was a religious school that might not uh, deal well with uh, biochemistry and stuff. So they had one of the um, re, uh, Canadian chairs of cell and developmental research uh, by, in biology, who was actually one of the um, professors there. And I had uh, seen a lot of her research, was interested. I applied to several um, universities across Canada. I really wanted to see the West Coast and somehow figure how to tie it all, all together, you know, growing up on a in a small, small town, in, a, in a, a small, you know, on the farm, essentially, I knew I wanted to kind of see what the horizons out there were like, and I thought the West Coast was pretty awesome. Um, I applied broadly. I ended up um, getting almost a, you know, a, a really, really great scholarship to Trinity, and so all everything put together, it just made sense, and it was a really nice transition for me to be at a smaller university plus uh you know for for those uh, academic reasons and uh and i was there for three years i i uh, got my biochemistry degree and went directly to med school and why oncology so i was interested in oncology uh from very early on from from a scientific point of view i did uh, a lot of lab research actually in my undergraduate degree and a thesis in um, cell and developmental biology in the area of neoplasia um and then hold it hold it, hold it. what's neoplasia so neoplasia is the growth of new cells. So I was actually researching um, the migration and, and cell replication and division and migrational pro processes of um, mechanosensory neurons. And so that's what kind of got me interested in the cancer biology and research. And, uh, but I knew that I loved to travel and I knew that I loved um, working with people and I knew that I wanted to uh, help people um, at a very intimate level um, and 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 so that's kind of what led me to apply to medical school my parents told me that ever since I was two I wanted to be a doctor but I was if, I don't know I thought it was probably more likely if you really asked me that I, I would be a veterinarian but I loved animals I had five horses growing up loved dogs but um, but at the end of the day, I think when the opportunity came came down, and I'd, I'd thought a lot about the research that I'd done and and w how I felt about um, about moving forward with it all, and I, I ended up going to medical school, and and I don't have any regrets. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Okay, so let's come yeah. back to COVID. Um, yeah. So uh, we were chatting about a lot of the different. Uh, um, yeah. Solidarity mm -hmm. trials that you mentioned. Um, we okay. talked about steroids. What about vaccines? Have you followed any of the vaccine development? Do you have a sense of, uh, of who's leading and uh, when we're actually uh, going to have a chance of having a vaccine? Yeah, so briefly, because I, I know we got a lot to talk about today, and we did talk a little bit about vaccines the last time, um, that there were um, 10 uh, inhuman uh, trials right now um, in terms of vaccine development. There's over a hundred vaccines in total across the globe being developed at, in different phases, different stages um, in the laboratory and animal models. But there are approximately 10 that are being studied through mostly in the, in, um, the US and the UK. 
Um, and and we, we've yet to see some of the results. The va vaccines are kind of across the spectrum in terms of their mechanism of action and approach. So we're kind of trying to see still what works best, what populations um, is it most effective, what targets um, are, are, are eliciting an immune response. And this all does take time. So we're really waiting for a lot more definitive results, but the process is being expedited as much as possible, um, given the, the collaborative effort, efforts in and also by the um, government allowing us to bypass a lot of normal parts of, of what would normally be uh, criteria for going through phase development in normal times in order to expedite these results. And I'm told that we're a year, 18 months away, even at the fastest. Do you agree or what's your sense? Yeah, I think, I think that's hopeful. I think that's really hopeful. I think, I think it's possible. Um, it really does, uh, you know, I, I'm a very hopeful person in general, so I think anything's possible. And I think we have every right to be optimistic. I think there are some of the most intelligent researchers and, and, and intricate efforts that are just so well planned and thought out. Um, right now, I know there's still so much that we don't know and we need to know and we need to put together, but um, the rate at which it's happening um, is, is, is impressive. It's just, we still, we've still got a ways to go. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, um, Southern United States, uh, Texas, Arizona, we're seeing uh, new highs on a daily basis of infections. Um, they're the ones that uh, um, closed early, late and opened early. Um, you know, we've got uh, rallies with Donald, President Donald Trump with uh, thousands of people. We got protests with thousands of people and, uh, and whatnot in the streets. Is this going to continue to go up or is it going to die down over the summer? What's your sense of things? I think it will eventually level off. I mean, it's going to run out of people to infect, so the numbers have to go down at some point. And, you know, we will catch up with things like um, therapies that are going to help lower the death rates when we get more information from those trials, such as the ones we ju just spoke about. And, um, and in terms of a vaccine as well, I mean, that's quite hopeful in terms of reducing numbers. But in the short term, um, you know, we we are still wearing masks. We are still social distancing, and and we believe these efforts are you know going to to help control those numbers and decrease. But um, you know we're we are in a, in a state where you know we will be running out of out of um, out of out of people that will that will get the virus if they are exposed. So again, the most important things are are reducing exposure. And and I and uh, and really, um, you know, um, looking at kind of at, at basically the the evidence and 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 implementing the therapies that are there to to reduce the rates. So I do think it will will decrease. Will decrease. So you think that uh, we're actually reaching herd immunity, or have a chance of reaching that herd immunity? Uh. Well, yes. I mean, I, yeah, I do. I'm not sure if we're at that place right now. I think one of the things that will be helpful in determining who has been exposed and didn't get the virus, who's been exposed and does have immunity and therefore it won't affect, um, you know, is through serology testing when that right. goes out. So these things, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's definitely hard to say there will be a concept of herd immunity in the sense that, you know, the people that have already gotten it for all intensive purposes, as long as, you know, gene reassortment and the virus doesn't change in strain, you know, too soon, um, those people won't be affected again. And so therefore herd immunity will exist um, and, and will be a protective factor to those two, two, two new incidences. But well, you know, um, I, I interviewed this guy that was uh, a researcher at Mount Sinai and, uh, and he thought that the vaccine was going to be a long way away. He thought that uh, um, social distancing, people wouldn't adhere to it. And so therefore, we wouldn't be able to dampen it naturally. And so he said, the only way is herd immunity. And there's two ways of do that. One, wait till it actually infects everyone. Or he said, what we can do is we can infect the people that are gonna be least impacted. And so we actually yeah. want to launch a study with a healthy 18 to 30 year olds or 18 to 40 year olds, I think it was, in a healthcare setting, infect them with the virus, get them healthy again, and then put them back in the community, hoping that that would create herd immunity. What do you think of that? Any, makes any sense? I think it's very interesting. Um, you know, it is a concept, absolutely. I think that I guess I would have several questions around kind of the ethics of infecting more people with the virus um, and how, how that would be constructed, how, how, you know, 
would all of those people remain in hospital through the entire time and therefore you know that's that's a, a large probably number of patients to be hospitalized when you know it depends on on where we're at in in that geographical area whether that hospital is still potentially you know requiring use its hospital beds or the need for for that um and then you know will they have enough power uh also the funding i ha would have some questions about and um yeah, I guess just the ethics and um, I guess several questions around around that. It's, you know, we're in strange times. We've never, is, something has ever but, been you know, my mom a time before that, that, we, uh, my mom that we wanted to infect the healthy and quarantine the, the quarantine the healthy and, and, and infect the non uh, the healthy. So it's very interesting. My mom talks me that at, at you know, one point in time in the past, people used to have chicken pox parties. Um, so that uh, what they would do yeah. is when one kid in the community in the neighborhood got chicken pox, they'd invite a whole bunch of other kids over because they wanted them to get chicken pox when they were young. Because I guess it's a lot worse when you get it if you're old. And, and that was before, I presume, a chicken pox uh, vaccine was developed. But that's, that's right. That was what was done to create herd immunity. Yeah, it is one way. I mean, chicken pox are, haven't been shown to be quite as severe um, in terms of death rates, especially, and, and the transmission factor a little lower. So it is more controllable altogether. And I think that that's what we're dealing with. And I think um, when we look at any kind of respiratory complication, I know we were, you know, had a few things on our, our agenda, the cigarettes and lung cancer and, 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 uh, and the coronavirus, and we're speaking about all these things. Um, really, uh, it, it does come down to when can we catch things at a controllable state and, and, and timing is a huge factor. So that's some, that, that is one uh, differentiating factor potentially with, with chicken pox and chicken pox virus and coronavirus. But I would, I would be interested in these questions, the answers to these questions too. I'm not an infectious disease specialist, but uh, perhaps we can, we can talk to someone and then or, uh, someone who is and then reconvene and, and, and see what they have to say because I would be very interested. Sounds good. Okay, let me ask you another question if I could. Um, something like 80% of the people that are put on ventilators don't survive. Any idea why these aren't more effective? Why ventilators aren't more effective? I think because, uh, you know, well, I mean, <laughs> ventilators are, in, are effective um, if they're given to, to the right person at the right time. I think identifying, you know, in general, um, who is needing a ventilator and, and, and when, to, when to, you know, move to that method. It's because we know that, you know, usually people that require ventilators are trending down in their oxygenation status so quickly that, that it does become obviously a bit of a timing factor. And then of course, um, it's, it's difficult to determine, you know, when that person isn't able to breathe on their own or oxygenate or supply oxygen to the rest of the body adequately, you know, when, uh, you know, when to, when to, you know, move on to the ventilator because being on a ventilator itself has a lot of risks as well. Of course, we know that, um, you know, there are certain parameters that we can look at such as cigarette smoking and, and other kind of health predictors to show us that maybe someone needs a ventilator before someone else, but it's a bit of a fine line. And then coming off the ventilator, as we know, is such a, um, a relatively rare, as you've mentioned, thing that we're a little bit hesitant once we put someone on a ventilator because the chances that they'll come off is, is, is very low. Now, you've mentioned cigarette smoking a couple of times. So just out of interest, you know, if you've been smoking cigarettes, you must have done something to the lungs. Are you therefore more uh, susceptible to COVID-19? Well, even though those exact studies um, probably will eventually come out, uh, we do know that smoking causes damage to the lungs, causes a wide variety of uh, comorbidities in terms of cerebrovascular disease, cardiovascular disease, lung cancer, um, the list goes on. Really, uh, because of this, it, you know, we can, we can easily predict that the um, severity of COVID-19 in smokers is going to be worse, just like it is, for example, um, in, with tuberculosis. And we look at those rates, you know, looking at studies, it shows that people that smoke more than 20 cigarettes a day are at a two to four fold increase of developing tuberculosis. You, uh, you know, other studies, recent studies show that 
um, if you're a smoker, you're four, to four times more uh, at a higher risk of developing pneumococcal infections, pneumonia, each year. Um, and this is basically due to the, the damage caused by cigarettes. There's a, just like the coronavirus in the beginning, um, there's a lot that we didn't know about tobacco and cigarettes and adverse effects, of course, when it first, it first started in America and, and, um, and what we do know now and the developmental history of it and why we're seeing incidences and rates and the biology and the mechanisms of action with that damage that's done is all, is all a process that's, 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 uh, that's pretty, pretty, pretty well thought out, pr pretty well identifiable now. Um, it just now becomes about, an, about education. So it makes sense to me that uh, if you smoke, smoke cigarettes, you're going to get smoke in your lungs, you're going to harm your lungs, you're going to have cardiovascular uh, problems. But uh, how does it cause cancer? How does it cause lung cancer? Well, among, among a variety of things, um, uh, cigarettes basically, well, let, let's kind of look at the, look at the broad view to, to begin with. Um, smoking rates have decreased over time, but they're still quite significant. And tobacco use is currently the leading cause of preventable, preventable death worldwide. Cigarette so is the leading cause of preventable deaths worldwide. More yes. than autos, more than swimming pools, more than anything else. Well, we're talking about preventable deaths. So um, under the umbrella of, of preventable deaths, tobacco use is, is the number one. Okay. Um, there's over 1.3 billion cigarette smokers worldwide. That's about 20% of the population still smoking. It's a little bit more, uh, the incidence is a little higher in men than in women. Um, but we still see, you know, an astonishing number of people smoking, um, despite the warnings, despite the warnings of, of lung cancer. And just to, to show you the, the history of when it basically, you know, when these warnings first started, the American Tobacco Company began in, in early, in late 1800s, and there was about 4 billion cigarettes sold at that time. And then the first reported connection between smoking and cancer and lung cancer came in 1912, in fact. And then by 19, 1912, those were the first medical reports that came out. But then by 1924, there was over 70 billion cigarettes sold. Then in, it, it wasn't until 1947 that there was enough evidence to suggest that smoking, in fact, causes cancer. And then in 1967, we had the Surgeon General warning that definitively links um, smoking to lung cancer and heart problems. And then in 1970, that's when tobacco manufacturers were legally obliged to write um, the, the print, the health hazard on the, on the label. But back to kind of the mechanism of action of how cigarettes cause cancer. In a single cigarette, there's, there's, there can be up to 4,800 compounds. These include things like hydrogen cyanide, ammonia, formaldehyde, arsenic, um, toluene, nicotine. Um, most of these are in one of two phases that, that are in, a, in, in cigarette in the habit of smoking. And there's a vapor phase, there's a particulate phase. Nicotine is in the particulate phase or has its greatest effect in that phase which means that it gets into the system, it's a stimulant, and it facilitates dopamine release in an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. And with that dopamine release, it stimulates a very pleasurable effect such that it's a positive reinforcer and you want more and you want it every day and, and, you, and, and you get used to having those higher levels of dopamine from the cigarettes. And that's why it is very powerful and very addictive and so difficult to stop. They say that the somatic and psychological dependence of the effect of nicotine through smoking is more powerful than cocaine, alcohol, heroin, um, marijuana, uh, and, 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 a, and a plethora of other drugs. Sure, so it, it is a very, it's, very it's powerful. Not, it's not as strong a dopamine response. So why would it be? It's, it's a more habitual dopamine response or something? 
in terms of the strength of dopamine response, I mean, it could, ha could have to do with a variety of factors such as ease of use, such as, um, you know, the fact that we, that it's, it's accessible. It's something that, that a lot of people still find generally acceptable. Um, and, and, and it's tolerated and, and it's, uh, it's something without more side effects than these other things. Although this, this, and when I say side effects, um, these are kind of more the visible than the invisible side effects. Right. And, 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 and that can be a major, uh, you know, there's not a real, um, hangover from, from nicotine. So, the next so, day so a lot of teenagers are going crazy with vaping, uh, which is almost completely nicotine and water, is it not? That's right. Um, and uh, I presume that that's got to be extremely addictive as well. Yeah, so it can be extremely addictive. Um, and the vaping, I guess the, the, the positive thing about, about vaping is that it does remove a lot of those toxic compounds and carcinogens. But um, we do know that we've been able to identify up to 70 carcinogens in a single cigarette, at least 11 that are very known human carcinogens, seven that are probable. We do know that some of these carcinogens are even still found in the products um, that are contained in vape smoke. So it's not, it's not still without risk, but at least it's the lesser um, but again, very addictive. It can be very addictive. So what happens is the pathway to cancer is that is that these all of these kind of compounds and toxic compounds um, and carcinogens are are there. They they act. They form um, basically irreversible attachment to your DNA, and and that creates genetic mutations, and that can cause a cell through a downstream process depending on where these mutations are depending on other mutations that you may have in the body from multifactorial effects um, that can set you down a trend of of irreversible um, replicative pathway and develop a, a tumor clone that eventually becomes um, a cancer so an irreversible adaptation of the dna so something from the cigarette the carcinogen from the cigarette is getting mm -hmm. into the DNA of a cell and changing that DNA. That's right. Really? So what we were born with, the DNA that we were born with is actually changed by smoking yeah. cigarettes. It does. That's right. So basically what happens is it, um, the carcinogens for, for like any like carcinogenic pyrolytic products is like the general umbrella term polycyclic polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which you've probably heard of, they form these things called epoxides, which are very strained three atom ring, which can then, you know, get into the DNA and cause disruptions in the DNA and mutations. And if they're in particular genes, for example, in cancer medicine that we know are tumor suppressor genes or what's called oncogenes, which would actually, you know, uh, program the cell through that DNA mutation to, to, divide uncontrollably and become a cancer. So that's kind of how, how that process in, in general works. There's also radioactive um, carcinogens such as lead 201, uh, polonium 201. They basically are uh, gather in hot spots. So, so they'll, they'll deposit in hot spots where all your little bronchial tubes branch out and develop and they will stay there um, for, for, a significant amount of time releasing radioactive um, material into the into the lungs, and that can also have a significant be a significant contributor to DNA damage uh, through through radioactive decay as well. Oh, um, you know, they say, yeah, if if you smoke up to, I think the numbers are, if you smoke up to a, a pack and a half of cigarettes a day, it's it's equivalent to a dose of about sixty to. 100, over 150 millisieverts per year. And that in comparison to living near a, a nuclear power station is at a rate of about 0 0.001 millisievert a year. And then the, the daily cumulative dose of a person in North America would be about three millisieverts a year. So these, the, the doses of, of even the radioactive process is significant from cigarette smoking. So you get more radioactive material in your body from cigarettes than you would from being near a nuclear power plant. Oh yeah, <laughs> a lot more, <laughs> a lot, lot more, and a lot more than than a than a CT scan as well. Well, Kate, uh, Dr. Kate uh, Barrett, uh, we hope uh, to get you back uh, on numerous occasions to talk more about uh, different medicines, uh, different illnesses, uh, solutions, what's going on, etc. 
but we just talked COVID-19 and cigarette smoking. Do you have a message for our audience tonight? Like, don't smoke? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot of um, programs out there uh, to to help with smoking cessation. And I think for so many, you know, it's not just linked to lung cancer, it's linked to so many different types of, of, of cancers. Um, head and neck cancer, leukemia, pancreatic cancer, bladder cancer, cervix cancer. And, um, you know, we do see um, a decrease in incidence of some of the ones that are more heavily attributed to risk factors like smoking, but we're still a long way from there. Um, I think, you know, support fr from any level, um, from, from many levels is available. And it just kind of takes, um, you know, the individual to, to seek that out and to have the support of friends and family. Um, you know, there's a lot of different um, medical um, strategies out there, everything from, from patches to gum in terms of the nicotine replacement to, you know, psych, uh, psychological tools, therapy support, um, and, um, and also pharmacological therapy. It's important to mention you know, that, that if you are a smoker, mention this to your, to your family doctor and ask what your risks are, what things you might go under, have to undergo screening for. Um, there's screening opportunities uh, for low dose CT scans um, to have a, on, a, on an annual basis through the Ontario Lung Cancer Screening Pilot Program, for example, um, if, you, if you fit certain criteria. Uh, so basically there, there's a lot of programs out there to identify and catch things while they're early um, and to, to, you know, know your cardiovascular risk and, and get you on the right medications if required to really help save your life. So, you know, um, it, it just, uh, it, it takes reaching out and, and it takes, it takes, uh, identifying and enlisting support. Okay. Thank you for that. What about for COVID-19? What's your message there? Wear a mask? Yeah, I think we should still wear masks. I think we should still practice social distancing and all of these these measures that that uh, that that have been have been ongoing over the past uh, five, four or five months. I think you know um, those those are the, until until we kind of catch up with a lot of the results from these trials and are able to learn more about you know the vaccine development and and uh, serology testing and trying to to get a better better grip on this. Um, you know, we do have to practice those, those general safe measures of, of uh, trying to reduce exposure through contact as much as possible. Mm -hmm. If people want to access your uh, consulting services, uh, Blue Guide, how do they do that? Uh, yeah, so so we have a website. Um, that there's a contact form through the website. Uh, the phone number is listed on the website as well. It's www.blueguide, spelled B-L-U-E-G-U-I-D-E dot C-A or, or dot U-S. And, um, and I also have a Facebook page. Um, and uh, yes, happy to, uh, to help and, and chat with anyone who is uh, interested in, in uh, some support for their cancer navigation and understanding and expanding their treatment options. And these would be for patients and families or just patients? Yeah, patients and their families. We usually better, talk to, to both at once. <laughs> better dealing with any kind of cancer. Uh, any, yeah, mostly solid tumors. Um, uh, and although we, uh, you know, don't see many pediatric cases, it's mostly um, adult, adult cancers, but many different forms, everything from, from glioblastomas to lung cancers uh, to, to breast and prostate, of course, um, stomach cancer, lung cancer. <laughs> well, Dr. Kate Barrett of uh, Blue Guide, thank you very much for joining us tonight and talking about COVID-19, about uh, respiratory problems, about cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm on uh, once a week on Canada One TV. Please join me uh, and or you can get my uh, podcasts and, uh, and video casts on my website, briancromie.com, either backslash, backslash video or backslash podcasts. Thanks and see you next time. Thanks, Kate. Thank you so much, Brian. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.
buying or selling.